I am very grateful to all of you for being with us for the 100th Prayer Not Fest. They gave me the title to speak on, Small Things Can Make a Big Difference. So this small little thing will try to make some difference tonight. Actually, this temple we're living, or that we're gathered together in, began as a very tiny half of room, which was rat infested and dilapidated. And a few of us were living down there. And the rest of the building had about 3,000 high school students, coaching class students, a stocking manufacturing company, and a medical clinic. So it started very small. The rats were very big, I have to say. <laughs> but everything else was very small. And because there was, by the grace of our Gurudev's example, Srila Prabhupada, there was a vision of what could be possible. And when there is a vision of what could be possible <clears throat> beyond ourselves, by God's grace, then incredible things can unfold. It is a universal truth that small things can make very big differences, either positive or negative. Just describing the principle from a negative perspective, <clears throat> malaria is just a tiny little mosquito. Yes? Some of you men, young college boys, you may be proud of your strength. But compare a mosquito's arm to yours. <laughs> You may be going to a very high, prestigious university. Compare a mosquito's brain to yours. You may be proud of how much you can eat. Compare a mosquito's digestive capacity to yours. It's inconceivably tiny. But yet, one little mosquito just when you don't even know it. You may be sleeping. You may be dreaming of how next week you're going to take a vacation and climb to Mansrover. And while you're making that dream, the little mosquito You don't hear him or her. <laughs> and you can't even see with your eyes that little germ, that little whatever it is that goes into your bloodstream. So it begins very, very tiny. But then in a week or so, when you're ready to pack up, you know, to go on your trip to Mansrovar, <laughs> You're in critical condition, being shipped off to a hospital with malaria. A little thing, a very small thing, made a big difference in your life. And one little spark, a little spark this big, 
When you light a match, it begins with a tiny, tiny little spark. And if that match is left in the wrong place, that little spark can create a forest fire that burns thousands and thousands of miles of trees and homes and buildings. I'm from Chicago, and we had a famous fire called the Chicago Fire. And according to legend, some old lady named Mrs. O'Leary, she was milking her cow. And not far away, they were slaughtering cows. So I guess cows have their revenge. This, there was a little flame this big in a lantern, like a candle, and the cow kicked it. And it hit the hay. The entire city of Chicago burned to the ground. Nothing could stop it. Small things can make a big difference. And too many times I see, even among people I know, they're driving a car and just a moment in inattention and there could be a crash. Many people could be dead. All their dreams and expectations finished. It really is the nature of the world that small things are so important to be attentive to. According to the Vedic literatures, the living force that animates every human being, every animal, all species of life is the Atma. And within this material creation, this living force, and we see what souls are accomplishing on so many levels in this world, the Atma is one ten thousandth the size of a tip of a hair. That's a small thing. But that's who you are. That's who the presidents, the great dictators, the great liberators, the great scientists, the geniuses. That consciousness is manifesting from an atma, one ten thousandth the size of the tip of a hair, impossible to perceive by material senses, even with the most sophisticated technical machines. That's the living force, the Atma. And the body, whoever we may be, whether we're world champion wrestlers or cricket players, the physical body begins with a tiny little seed. We don't even know it's there. So insignificant. When the mother and father come together, they're not like organizing, you know, this, to get that little seed in here. And they don't know what's happening. Just this little, tiny seed that can't even perceive with your eyes enters into the mother's ovum and gradually it, it emulsifies, it begins to develop. And a few years later, that little seed becomes, what's his name, Sachin Tandukar? <laughs> or Chhatrapati Shivaji? or who, whoever you may consider great. Small things. Recently I was in the redwood forests in California and I saw this tree, the second largest tree on planet Earth. It's huge. It has statistics. 20 grown adults, if they hold hands and stretch their arms out as far as they could go, that's how much people it would take to circle, make a circle around that tr the trunk of the tree. 100 and 
75,000 basketballs you could fit in it if you hollowed it out. Or enough petrol, if you hollowed it out, you could put enough gasoline or petrol to drive around the world two and a half times. One tree, that's a big tree. And I looked on the ground and I saw a little cone and I saw the size of a seed. It was about this big. And that tree came out of that little seed. If we just allow that seed to be in a favorable condition, we could bring out its potential. And this is very much an important part of being successful in ever, anything we do in life. To understand even the smallest thing, what is the potential? Some of the most gigantic corporations in the entire planet Earth began as a small little family store with the husband and wife working, and that's it. And now there's hundreds and thousands of people. Because there was a vision. There was a determination. There was a faith in what is possible. And that faith in what is possible can rescue us from complacency and from ever being discouraged by any setbacks. Because setbacks are crucial for growth to be strong. That is a historical fact. And especially in matters of love. Love is very much expressed through details. A mother's love is in little details. I remember my mother, she was very loving. I used to tell her, why are you wasting your time with all these little things? And when I grew up, those little things that I thought she was wasting her time with is what transformed my life more than anything up until that time. A smile, a kind word can make such a big difference in a person's life. My beloved Guru Srila Prabhupada, I have God brothers and God sisters and they tell me, I remember one lady, she was telling me, in 1972, how many years ago was that? 40 years ago. 40 years ago, she was in the back of a temple and Srila Prabhupada happened to walk by and he smiled at her and asked her if she was happy. That was the only interaction she ever personally had with him in her life. And she said, that moment, it only lasted about five seconds. That smile, that compassionate glance, and that simple question of concern is what has nourished her and given her strength to overcome every kind of difficulty and remain positive, remain hopeful, and remain happy. More than anything else in life, it has sustained her. A small act of love. He could have, he could have just walked by. Recently, I was in Los Angeles, I was in Beverly Hills. It was last May at this conference, it was the Milken Global Conference, where about four to 5,000 of the leaders of politics, business, science, entertainment in the world come together every year. It cost $5,000 a ticket, but I was invited to speak so I got in for free. <laughs> <laughs> the 
But I went to one seminar on leadership. And they had some of the very most powerful leaders of sports, of business, of science, of financing on a panel. So I was curious, what are they going to say about leadership? And many things I could talk about, which were quite um, very, very interesting. They move my heart. And to move a Swami's heart in a business conference, it's not an easy thing. <laughs> but Mr. Milken, he is a incredible genius with statistics. He had this incredible statistic, which was talking about good leadership. <clears throat> now, I'm not a genius with anything, especially statistics. So I don't remember the numbers, but I can get them for you. But he, he had a graph that he put on this big computerized screen in the Beverly Hilton Hotel. And he explained the graph. It was about how to enthuse maximum creative efficiency in an employee. Would you like to hear this? <laughs> I'm really happy you said that. <laughs> he explained, if you don't pay a person enough for their basic comforts and needs, they're always in anxiety. This is from a business perspective. I'm not talking to the brahmacharis on this one. <laughs> but still, the conclusion of this story is as much important to the brahmacharis as everybody else. Then they're always going to be insecure, they're going to be thinking about alternative jobs. They're going to be unstable. So somehow or other, when you get to them, when you give them enough, so they're actually stable, so they actually have confidence in their future, then you get this level of creative efficiency. And then the graph showed and this was something that was surveyed over years and years by topmost universities. No matter how much more you give a person, the creative efficiency does not go any higher. If that comfort zone is $100,000, if you give the person $500,000, a million dollars, $10 million, a hundred million dollars, you don't get any more creativity. You don't get any more productivity. It's just like this. However, if you give a person a sense of appreciation, if you give a person a sense that he or she is really valued for what they're doing, if you actually give the person a feeling of love, then their productive, their creative productivity soars way beyond it. In other words, little things of kindness and giving a person encouragement to the heart, even in the financial world, what to speak of anywhere else, is a greater initiative, incentive, and inspiration than any amount of money or power or prestige. It seems like a small thing to say thank you to a person, to say this is very wonderful what you're doing. <laughs> we really appreciate it. But it makes a big difference. And I think in all of our dealings in life, this is very important. I've never been married. 
as a Swami, I'll never get married. <laughs> so I don't know that much about married life. But because so many married people come to me with their problems, I know too much about married life. <laughs> whenever, the, whenever people come to me, it's like they have such a unique secret problem that's so, so much their own. But interestingly, Almost everyone tells me the same thing. <laughs> and it's almost all about little things, small things. They could make such a positive big difference or such a negative big difference. You know, so many times the wife says, my husband, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't care about me. He doesn't love me. He doesn't appreciate anything I do. And she's crying and crying. And I asked the husband, you know, you know, do you care about your wife? He says, of course. I give her so much money. I give her clothes. I give her a house. I give her, you know, whatever she wants. I said, well, do you ever tell her you appreciate? He said, she should already know these things. <laughs> This is a standard answer. <laughs> well, what if, she, you know, there's a, you know, she doesn't understand. Well, she should understand. I give her everything else. Well, actually, I do tell her. When was the last time you told her? I don't remember. <laughs> I've seen small things like a thank you save a marriage from total collapse if it's a little consistent. <laughs> it's a small thing, but it makes a bigger difference than all the big things you're working for in most occasions. On the spiritual platform, it is these small things that really are the way we express our love for God. We may do big things. We may do great things. But love is so much about what we put in the details. There's that beautiful story of Krishna. He was living in Dwarka. And I believe Narada Muni wanted to take him away for somewhere, to, to go somewhere. And all the queens of Dwarka were begging, no, no, don't take him away, don't take him away. And Krishna said, you know, it was, it was agreed. Satyabhama and others would bring their jewels, diamonds, emeralds, rubies, gold, silver to put on one side of a scale and Krishna would sit on the other. And whatever weighed as much as Krishna, they would take instead of Krishna. And they put mountains of the most precious, this would be billions of rupees, trillions of rupees, quadru quadrillions of rupees of emeralds and diamonds stacked high and Krishna weighed more. And then Rukmini, who wanted Krishna just to be with her so bad, she said, take away all the jewels. And she took one tulsi leaf, not a tulsi plant in a pot, one single... <laughs> one single Tulsi leaf. 
how much does a Tulsi leaf weigh? It's only this big. And with love and devotion, she put that Tulsi leaf on the scale, and the scale went, <laughs> and Krishna jumped way up. And he was defeated, and he stayed with Rukmini. Patram pushpam palam toyam yome bhakta priyachchati. Krishna tells in Gita that it is only love, it is only affection that attracts him. He says, if one offers to me with love and devotion, even a leaf, a flower, a piece of fruit, or a little water, I accept it. And the Srimad Bhagavatam reveals to us that not only does Krishna accept, he's conquered by, he's defeated by the love of the devotee. Even if it's expressed with the smallest gesture. We often talk about Kolavecha Sridhar. He was in poverty. He wore rags. He lived in a single room, tiny straw hut with no furniture. He just had one old dented, beat up iron water pot. And he made his living by selling banana leaves. And every now and then he'd have a banana or a banana root or some banana bark, whatever he could get. And the Supreme Lord himself, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, would go to Sridhar to argue over the price of bananas for three hours every day. The husband of the goddess of fortune, does he need a banana? But he does. It's the love of his devotee. Every day, Lord Chaitanya would eat his meal off a banana leaf that Kolavecha Sridhar gave him. And it made everything so delicious, just to be connected with that leaf, which, would, which cost nothing. Because if you've ever been to Bengal, there are banana leaves every place you put your eyes. There's no shortage of banana leaves in West Bengal. But that simple leaf, such a small thing made such a big difference that it literally conquered the heart of the absolute truth. The creator of all existence. Lord Chaitanya explained, what is bhakti? It's, it begins in our heart as the bhakti lata bija, a little seed. We all have that seed. When we come in contact with great personalities, with great gurus, that seed is awakened in our heart. And when we take serious and water that seed through our spiritual practices, through chanting God's names, through hearing the glories of the Lord, through doing seva for the Lord and the devotees, through showing compassion to other living beings, when we water that little seed, it grows, it sprouts, it becomes a plant, it becomes a tree, and it awakens fruits, fruits of prema bhakti, ecstatic love, that could quench all one's hunger and thirst. The hunger and thirst of the heart with love forever. That small thing, just by a moment's association with a great soul, our whole life could be transformed because that seed begins to grow. Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sastrakoi, Lava Matra, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sidihoi. This is a really small thing. But this verse says, this is the declaration of all the great scriptures and all the great histories of spirituality that even a moment's association with the lover of God 
can open the doors to the supreme perfection of liberation. Lava Matra technically means one twelfth of a second. That's a small thing. It's hard to even calculate a twelfth of a second. I mean, since I, since I, that last sentence, hundreds of twelfths of seconds have already passed, and we haven't even noticed it. Imperceptible. But even that twelfth of a second if our heart is receptive to receive the grace of a great soul, it opens the doors to the supreme perfection of liberation. <coughs> the gopis, even Shukadeva Goswami, Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, these great acharyas, Ramanujacharya, Madhvacharya, internally even Shankaracharya. They honor the gopis as the highest, most fully enlightened transcendentalists. We read about great kings who conquer lands for God. We read about people who build massive temples or holy places for God. This is all wonderful things if it's done with the right motive. We read about great scholars who can enchant, enthrall, and mystify people's minds by incredible scholarship and oratory skills. But the gopis, even greater than the yogis who could perform miracles, who could create planets, who could kill people by saying a mantra, who could read people's minds. The yogic cities are extremely powerful if you know how to use them. But the greatest yogis consider the gopis to be so far more advanced and more enlightened than anyone else. And what do the gopis do? Small things. They conquer Krishna by their laughter, by their smiles. They make malas, garlands. That's what they do. <laughs> they go out and pick flowers one little flower at a time and put it on, string it on a garland. They make little flower seats for Krishna. They milk cow. Anybody could milk a cow. Anyone could make a garland. Every little detail is done with so much love, with so much care. Why? because there's actually a focus to please Krishna. In human relationships, if we really want to please the object of our love or the object of those who we are responsible for, it's in the big things, but filling the big things with the details. In fact, the very essence of life Atapum beard vijas dreshtas, varana shrama vibhagasha, shvanushtatasya dharmasya samsadir haritoshana. The real perfection, the success of our occupation, our duty, our spiritual duties, our worldly duties, whatever they may be, is to the degree they please Lord Hari. If we actually have the consciousness that I'm doing this to please somebody, to please God, to please the devotees, to please another person, we'll put our heart into it. And love is where we put our heart into. 
And unfortunately, people are so distracted from what really matters. Srila Prabhupada uses that very simplistic example of how the lady, she decorates her bird's cage with so much elegance. But her friend comes and looks inside and sees that the bird is starved to death. Because she forgot the simple, she's taking jewels and emeralds and all sorts of beautiful silks to decorate the cage. But she forgets to give even a little rice or a little water to the bird. That's the story of the world we live in today. In trying to accomplish things, we so much miss the very purpose of it all. Distracted by maya, by illusion. Those small things. What will please God? What will actually be in harmony with my very soul, my atma? What will actually give quality, fulfillment, and happiness to another human being? We are so distracted with so many things. It is said that a cultured society loves people and uses things. But in today's world, all too often, we use people and love things. But there could be no quality life there. There could be no fulfillment to the heart. Small things can make such big differences. Here in India, Mahatma Gandhi was a very small man. But he had a vision. He had a vision of what small things could do. He had a march for salt, right? <laughs> to get some salt from the sea. I mean, that doesn't sound like such a big thing, does it? He just sat in his little garden with a spinning wheel and made his own clothes. That seems like a small thing, doesn't it? special effects. <laughs> but, but that small little man just sitting at a spinning wheel and getting people to walk for some, to make some salt conquered the British Empire, the most powerful empire in the world. In those days the sun never set in the British Empire. Today, the weather in Britain is such, <laughs> you hardly ever see it rise. But it was small things that made such a big difference. Chhatrapati Shivaji, he was a real small guy. From what I've heard in histories, he was very small in size. But he was fearless. Because although he was against all odds, he understood the opportunity, the hope. He had a vision of what the potential could be, even for a small man. And in my own life, the most greatest inspiration is His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Such a small thing he did. And actually, it's the cause of not only this program today, but tens and thousands of such programs every day all over the world. He was a very small man. I'm small. And he, was, he was really small in size. And I remember sometimes people 
They'd hear his lectures, they'd read his books, they'd hear about him, and they would expect this gigantic, heroic avatar to appear. And then they see this little Prabhupada walking with a cane. And you know what would happen? Their hearts would melt. Not with awe and reverence, but with <coughs> gratitude and love. When he got on the Jaladuta in Calcutta on August, Friday the 13th, very auspicious day, Friday the 13th of August 1965, he boarded that boat. He had 40 rupees, seven dollars, but never could change it. He was already very sick, ill health. He went alone on a cargo ship. 38 days. While crossing the Arabian Sea, he had two heart attacks, severe seasickness, no medical help. He crossed, the, he crossed Asia, the Middle East, Europe, went through parts, the northern part of Africa. ultimately sailed all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And here this little man, he just had a little box of cereal, bag of cereals. He had a box of books, and he had a little cooker to cook. One, one pot that had four divisions, I believe. That's all he had. But he had such a vision of what could happen, the potential of God's grace. He began so small. He was staying at the YMCA Hotel in Butler, Pennsylvania. Somebody was sponsoring a little tiny room and he had to walk about eight blocks to someone's house to cook. <coughs> and the police, the the place he was cooking, Sally and Gopal Agarwal's house. They were not vegetarian. He would, the first day he came in, they were all eating meat. So you know what Prabhupada did? He made such a wonderful vegetarian feast for everyone and served it to everyone that he didn't, he never even said anything against their meat eating. They just loved his cooking so much, as long as he was there, they didn't eat anything except what he cooked. They were pure vegetarians for that time, without even being preached to, just being given something. He just cooked with so much love. It wasn't just the taste of the food, it was the love in which it was given. He conquered them. Little things. But he wanted to start a worldwide movement. Butler, Pennsylvania is just not the place to do that. It's a tiny town. He went to New York City. And from New York City, he would just, with his little cane, he would just walk down the streets and there would be limousines and Empire State Buildings and all these gigantic, you know, Fifth Avenue and Central Park. And then there was the ghettos of the Bowery and there was the violence and, and various other areas. New York is immense. The crime, the money, the sensual enjoyments, the sins, the, the everything. Massive cathedrals, thousands of brothels. And there's a little Prabhupada. He has no money. He doesn't know a single person. He's just walking down the street with a cane. And he's just sitting in a park and singing. Or he's meeting someone. If you read his diary, it's incredible. If you read his diary from a... From a heartfelt perspective. He left Brindavan. He's a saint. He 
he was living now in Manhattan, and he writes how he was invited to someone's apartment. And he had a little kirtan, and there was like four people that came. And he said, they liked it. <laughs> he said, he was so enthusiastic, he liked it. Now I know for sure the prediction of Haridas Thakur and Lord Chaitanya that this name will be ch chanted all over the world will be fulfilled. Now, if any of us were to have a program like that with those four people and they just liked it, <laughs> we would probably be really depressed. That what am I wasting my time for? Huh? But Srila Prabhupada, even even his god brothers and god sisters and well wishers in America, in India were writing back to him it's hopeless it's impossible just come back but where there were no results to the parent eyes he saw a potential he saw an opportunity he had a vision and he had such faith in that vision and that's what it takes for small things to make a big difference. Radhe Sham Prabhu is a very small sized person. <laughs> and you know, when he came out of college, he didn't know what was going on actually. But look at what he's done because of a vision, because he just sees the possibility. Goranga Prabhu, at one time he was a little seed in the womb of this beautiful mother of Sachi Devi. Yes, and somehow or other she gave him milk and she taught him how to walk and she taught him how to talk along with his wonderful father, the late Jagannath Dev. You know, they were, they, they just, you know, he, 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 could you imagine Goranga not knowing how to talk? <laughs> Here's the lady that taught, that taught him how to speak his first words. I don't know what they were, mama or something like that. <laughs> Every devotee comes and says, my son, the first word he said was Prabhupada. And they're so proud. And they say, listen, listen, listen. And the child goes, didn't you, didn't you hear that? You know, Unless our ears are anointed with the wax of love. <laughs> We can't hear what the child saying. <laughs> but small things can make big difference. So on today, this very, very special event of the 100th prerna started with just a few people coming and it has reached so many because some of these devotees, you know, they've, they've persevered with hope. They have faith in the grace of God. If we, if we live in this spirit of devotion, we can attract the grace of God. That was Srila Prabhupada's lesson. There's that famous story where he was sitting on a park bench in Central Park before he even 
met Mukunda Maharaj or got the little storefront of 26 Second Avenue. He was just sitting on a park bench and he just met somebody there. And the person saw, this is an interesting, you know, you never saw swamis in New York in those days. And he asked him, you know, what, what, what are you doing? And Srila Prabhupada, with such enthusiasm, was telling him, I have centers all over the world. <laughs> and thousands of devotees and millions of books. And he didn't even have any assurance of his next meal or even a place to stay. He wasn't speaking for some marketing purpose. He was speaking for his heart. He saw the potential of God's grace. He saw the seed of what's possible, even in the smallest thing. And actually, everything great in this world begins with a seed, an idea, a purpose, and especially love. And when Srila Prabhupada did get that little storefront, he only had about four or five people who were not really following him. They just kind of were interested in him. And Prabhupada established the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and said, we will, we will have centers international society with centers all over the world. <coughs> now on one level we could think people like Prabhupada, you know, he's such a great Paramahamsa Mahatma, he had that vision. But we'll benefit so much more if we understand what Krishna, what God is teaching us through the great souls. Srila Prabhupada prayed to be a puppet of God's grace. Mukam karoti bachalam pangum langeti karim. When one just focuses on that on the, uh, and accesses the grace of God, a blind man could see the forest stars in the sky, a lame man can cross the biggest Himalayan mountains, a dumb man can speak eloquent poetry. power of God's grace. There's no limit. And to access that grace is why we come together to try to enthuse each other, to inspire each other with goodness, with character, with integrity, to make a real difference in this world. However much corruption, however much disaster there may be, we should enthuse, inspire each other with hope of the potential we have, individually and especially collectively. And to access that grace with, with a sincere and grateful and humble heart, we can chant the holy names. louder, please.